Well, it looks like we are about four minutes after, so um, we're going to go ahead and get started. And I do have a couple of housekeeping notes um, as we go through the presentation today. If you have questions for our presenter, if you wouldn't mind just putting the questions in the chat, and um, then we will go through those as we um, have time. And then at the end of the presentation, if we do have some extra time, we will allow people to actually unmute and ask direct questions uh, to our presenter um, towards the end of the session. So um, that said, I'm going to introduce a couple of the people we have on the call here from IEF. We have our executive director, Deborah Olson here with us this morning. And then we have our moderator, um, Sarah Conley, who is our conservation coordinator at IEF, and she is going to um, take it from here. So thank you, Sarah. Thanks, Julie. Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. We are so happy to have everyone at the conservation chat. Um, and of course, for today, IEF, and every day, honestly, IEF is very proud to feature the Uganda Conservation Foundation's Mike Kegwin as our guest for the July conservation chat. For those of you following these chats, Mike was actually our very first guest, and we are excited to have him back because, of course, there's always new work to talk about in Uganda. Um, he is the founding trustee of the Uganda Conservation Foundation, working closely with the Uganda Wildlife Authority for the recovery of Queen Elizabeth and Murchison Falls National Parks and to protect the wildlife therein. In 2016, Mike was awarded an MBE or Member of the Most Excellent Order for the British Empire for his conservation work. So he's kind of a big deal. IEF has supported UCF for over 10 years, working together to support the construction of 14 ranger stations, land and marine. Um, he's got more bona fides, but I think it's better if he just tells you about his work. Uh, welcome, Mike, we're so happy to have you. Hi, everyone, I'd love, lovely to um, see you all or, or see blank screens with your names. Some of the names I know, um, so hello to you. Um, I'm calling from um, the UK where I'm on my leave for the first time in 10 years. So it's lovely to, to be able to connect. It doesn't matter where we are. That's awesome. Um, well, thank you for being here. And yes, we have a whole bunch of great people. Um, hopefully at the end, we'll let everyone uh, unmute and show their screens and stuff. And we will give you a round of applause. But in the meantime, as Mike is talking, please put your questions in the chat and we will get them addressed as they go. Uh, but for now, Mike, why don't you take it away, um, share your screen and tell us all about the amazing work that you do. That's very sweet of you, thank you. Um, so in Uganda, we are not exactly, or were not exactly starting with national parks, with what you might expect to be in place to be able to manage a national park. Far from it, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, in fact, when I first went there, they'd had 40 years of, of war, of, of rebel activity, of severe poaching. But prior to that 40, those 40 years, um, Murchison Falls National Park was the most had the most animals per square kilometer and had 16,000 elephants. Um, but that was in the 1950s and 1960s. And during that time, um, the elephants were so numerous and the hippos so numerous that the then park management went to the level of actually having to cull elephants and, and hippos. Um, unfortunately, as you know, through the 70s, 80s, 90s and the millennium, we went through the rebel war but that meant that the national park didn't have the ongoing every year investments into infrastructure and developments and improvements that anywhere else you might expect to happen so 40 50 years of, of basically developing and being heavily poached was basically what we inherited lots of tracks in three percent of the park but what about the 97 percent of the park so when tourism happens, as it is still happening, it was only in 3% of the park. Now, that leaves a lot of the park to open up. And of course, animals go everywhere. So are we protecting, have we been protecting animals everywhere? And if we're going to offer more for tourism, new lodges, being able to go on new drives around the most incredible landscape, 
um, in the park, then we needed to be able to get into management control of the park. And much of what I'm presenting today has been um, our focus of, of that. So in 2001, we set up the Uganda Conservation Foundation. It was predominantly set up because we didn't see anyone else in the area. And we thought, why is there no one here doing what I expected organizations to be doing? There are problems that are, are easy to solve, but I thought the conservation world would, you know, I see the adverts on TV, I expected them to be doing this stuff. And I was perplexed as I wasn't seeing any of it being done. So after a few little projects and a few little deliverables here and there, um, a couple of donors said, well, we quite like working together. Why don't you set up an organization? So I set up with their guidance, um, the Uganda Conservation Foundation. And it really wasn't to do more at the beginning than to provide um, a, a, a governance and management structure through which um, we could attract funds to critical projects, manage it carefully, and actually start to resolve the problems on the ground. And, and that's why the Uganda Conservation Foundation was really developed. And since then, it's, it's grown because there are many projects and partners who um, route th funds through us um, to, to reach ground projects where they carry out their research or they carry out whatever program they're doing, as long as it's well managed and well thought out. Um, so that's why the UC, Uganda Conservation Foundation was created. And ultimately, though, it's not just about saving an elephant or saving a lion or a toad or whatever it is. It's, it's about the whole region. And unless we understood that the people who live in that area and that region agree with the value of the park and actually endorse it, it's always going to be fighting an uphill battle. And the battle is one that if they don't um, succeed in their lives, they're likely to turn to poaching. And our job is to make sure that we engage closely with the communities and the regional governments, um, uh, government structures, and make sure that we can create an environment in which there are multiple economies, whether it's tourism, um, whether it's fisheries or agriculture, um, even major industry. We have hydro dams in the park now and others who work together making sure that the park is successful and with it, so is the wildlife um, and the habitat is looked after, et cetera, et cetera. So we are very much part of a fabric of an economy um, and the local people are part of that. So we spend a lot of our time making sure that local people and we work well together. So first of all, where is Uganda and where are we? If you look on the right of the map, you can see where Murchison Falls is highlighted. And on the left of the map, with a pretty ugly me, um, that's where Murchison is, sorry, Uganda is. Surrounded by, on, the, on the western side by the Democratic Republic of the Congo, northern by southern Sudan, in the east it's Kenya, and in the south, Rwanda. An interesting bunch of countries. Uh, Eastern Congo has been the, the biggest war zone in the world for a long while. Whilst I was in Ashashira, south of Queen Elizabeth's National Park, we had six million people killed as a consequence of war. Um, and I was the one white guy in the area being able to understand what was really going on. Um, Southern Sudan has had its own problems as well. But it gives you an idea, all of our national parks uh, are based around the edge, the extremities of the country. Um, the other thing just to recognize is Uganda is on the edge, is on the Albertine Rift. There are two, two rift valleys going through Africa. This is the Albertine Rift, and there's obviously the Great Rift Valley, which goes through Kenya as well. But it for, the Albertine Rift forms the breakup of the Central and Western African rainforest into the Eastern and Southern African um, savannas. It's a mosaic of habitat, so the diversity of wildlife is quite extraordinary. The primates, the water birds, oh, the birds full stop, um, the, the savannas, it, it, there's every type of landscape you could, you could possibly consider. But it makes Queen Elizabeth's National Park and Murchison Falls National Park uh, an extraordinary place to go to because it 
when you're looking at a, a quintessential savanna, the next moment you're looking at a, a swamp with a, a shoebill stalk, and 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 uh, it's it's quite a contrast when it, when you then go in to see the chimpanzees five kilometres away in deep mature forests. Um, but it does also mean that the diversity, such as the hybridization of elephants between forest elephants and savanna elephants, is in this area. And that's something else that I've also been heavily involved with, making sure that we understand the hybridization and the difference between the forest and savanna elephants. So we have over the years um, grown quite dramatically. We started off in Queen Elizabeth's National Park, and um, we now uh, we have been focused with IEF, more in Murchison Falls, um, both of which are recovery programs, which essentially are putting in the foundations of protected area management. I'll come to it a little bit later. We also are now heavily involved in Kadepo Valley in the northeast of the country, and we run the countrywide carnivore and scavenger program. Um, a lot of the range of training is happening through us, which is, in, which is done in conjunction with the US military, the UK military, UNODC, the, um, the International Red Cross, um, when it comes to things like human rights and whatever, to make sure people are professional in what they're doing. Another project that we just split out is something we call technology and conservation. Technology obviously moves rapidly, and we all do our best to make sure that we know what our three-year-olds understand, which is always a long, a long way ahead of us. But um, we need to grasp and understand the capabilities and actually target them to where they will be the most valuable and the most cost-effective and fit the purpose for our, our needs in the protected areas. So technology and conservation is a new program for us where we're heavily involved in a lot of different things. Um, and finally, we've just um, taken on board a new program with a, a park that is right next door to Queen Elizabeth National Park, Shibali Forest, where I do believe you also have some other um, IEF partners in. Um, here we're working with Professor Colin Chapman, who's been there for 40 years, with Professor Richard Rangham and others um, from Harvard. And we are now beginning to manage and support their programs, which are which I'm very pleased to hear, moving more from academic research to actually helping the parks and making sure that the parks have a strong future going forwards, which to me is, is the real value. And if we're managing to, to get the heavyweights, as such as the two I just mentioned, Richard Rangham and Colin Chapman, to begin to, to be able to target the support that the wildlife and the forests all need, then we really are onto a winner. Um, rather than publishing hundreds and hundreds of papers without it actually are making a difference to the park. So those are the kind of projects we get involved with. There are others, but um, that's a snapshot of them. Going back to Murchison Falls, this is where the International Elephant Foundation with a couple of other partners, including Tusk Trust, David Shepherd Wildlife Foundation and, and Bush Gardens, have been very, very loyal to us for 10 to 15 years, and in some cases longer. We have as I said at the very beginning, inherited parks that do not have what you might expect them to have uh, across the parks, infrastructure, communications, training, rangers. So we've had to put that in. And to, to start with, we had no money. And I was called by great friends of mine who were chief wardens and then the director of field operations. And I was working as a Deloitte corporate strategist in London finishing off my last project on the Olympics in London. And they asked me to resign and come home, and I did. I looked at what we were facing, and frankly, it was endless poaching. Um, animals with three legs, lions caught in snares. Um, we had a third of the elephant population with limbs missing, trunks missing. Um, it was gruesome. And the worst thing about it all was we had no means to stop it. We couldn't prevent the poaching. We couldn't respond to the poaching. We couldn't even react to the, the wildlife that was injured that we should be able to save with vets and the basics. So we had to change very quickly. We had to engage the recovery program. And that is what IEF and, and the partners have enabled us to do. And as you'll see, we started from almost nothing to being 
one of probably two of Africa's most successful programs in terms of recovery. The wildlife numbers are rocketing up and we are in, in not in total control. And unfortunately, poaching in the last two months has spiked again, but we're in a better position to be able to, to manage it. But we have had, and I'll, I'll flick through pictures on, the, on, on this particular picture in the armory. On the left-hand side is snares, and on the right-hand side is more of the, the wheel traps, as we call them, bear traps, as you might know them. Now, we have removed 45 metric tons of um, snares from just tourism area um, in the last 10 years. Um, it is a dramatic amount of animals that have, have been killed or maimed. Um, but the more we remove, and at the moment we're removing about 2,000 a month. Now there's more than 2,000 a month out there. But because of what we're doing, we are managing to make the animal numbers recover incredibly quickly. And that's because of the amount of good water, good food throughout the year in the park. Hence it had the most animals per square kilometer. Animals don't migrate, they don't need to. So we protect them, the animal numbers go up. And to give you an example of this, and I'll show you at the very end, the aerial survey results also sponsored by IEF, um, the giraffe numbers, the Rothschilds now, now known as Nubian giraffes, went from 400 to over 2000. And we have over 70 to 80% of the world's Rothschilds giraffes. So to have that kind of success, for a species to re recovery is, is staggering. And, and that is purely down to the success of the Ugandan Wildlife Authority rangers and various teams removing these snares and making sure these animals were safe, i.e. removing mortality from the population. And then they rebounded very, very quickly. None of the animals can breed any quicker. So we're very fortunate for that. But this is the type of image that we don't like to show, but sometimes we have to. Um, here on the top left, you have an elephant with half a trunk, the rest of it hanging off. Unfortunately, we had another case like this um, last week. On the right, you've got an elephant with lots of snares around its ankles. Bottom left, you have a young male lion with, which was um, sliced almost in half. He actually survived. The vets managed to keep him going and he did okay and was breeding. And then on the right, um, although I haven't seen this, this uh, elephant for a while, probably is there, but um, she lost her whole trunk. Um, and she was able to eat by putting her face into a bush or into the water and managed to keep going. But this was a sort of horror story we were seeing without being able to react. And of course, thanks to the partners, predominantly IEF right in there, we were able to do just that. And we've created the recovery that is, is now well known across Murchison, but has to be sustained. So what, what I keep coming to the word recovery. Essentially, we're talking about making sure the four themes of protected area management are well put in place for the long term sustained recovery. That means you've got to have the infrastructure. Have you got what you need around the whole park, not just 3% of tourist area? to be able to sustain your patrols or sustain your effort to make sure that the communities don't get crop raids or to make sure your veterinary department is able to reach the areas where the problems are greatest. And that's the infrastructure. So we have had to completely rebuild the range of post distribution across the whole of the park. Now that has meant that we've put in over 20 range of posts. Um, if you can imagine the pressure of the past, was agriculture advancing everywhere. Uganda, there is, there's hardly any wildlife outside um, the parks in Western Uganda. And at the time of the creation of the parks, the ranger posts were distributed around the edges of the park. And I'll show you this on a map a little bit later, but the problem with that is that now the poachers walk between those ranger posts and get into the core of the park where there were no ranger posts. So whereas a ranger patrol might go in in one or two or three days in a month, that would leave 27, 28, or 29 days when they were not there, when poaching could happen. Of course, an animal's dead, it's dead. So we had to make sure that we were present 24-7, 365 days in the year, 
and to make sure that we were making sure the landscapes that were important to lions and elephants and giraffes had a permanent presence there and, and were protected from any poaching. Equally, on the second theme, we needed communications and information management. Only in the last few weeks have we managed to successfully get the digital radio system up and running. The phone system we put in last year, and we've had to work out how to manage it, but we're not talking about a, a country such as the US or in Europe where um, we have good GSM coverage. We have 80% of the park with no coverage, maybe 90%. But there are places where good coverage is possible. But using digital radios and phones and putting in a what, uh, what you call a PBX hotline, we're able to provide services that reach communities, tourism, the management headquarters in Kampala, and they're all able to route in to a joint operations command center where the calls can be triaged and managed and the appropriate responses can be provided by the decision makers, the wardens of the park, whether it's something to do with wildlife conflict, or it's a response from a veterinary team, or an anti-poaching team, or even if a tourist has had an accident or has seen something, anyone is able to, to contact and communicate. Teams on the ground are able to communicate and make sure that operations are also successful. And I'll come back to that in a minute. But again, we had Coverage of two to three percent ten years ago. Now we're up to eighty to ninety percent. So we're able, better able, with infrastructure and for communications and information management, to be able to manage or be in better management control of eighty to ninety percent of the park. That in itself is a dramatic difference. We also need to make sure that the rangers, the boys and girls on the, the men and ladies on the on the front line are better able and better motivated and better equipped to be able to do their jobs. Part of that comes to the welfare of them. Um, are they in accommodation where they're dry, they're safe? Do they, are they able to have clean water? Um, do, they have the, do they get paid on time? Do they have health insurance? Um, do they have a raincoat? Do they have Wellington boots? All of these, the answers were no previously, 10 years ago. Now. We have rucksacks, raincoats, good ranger posts. We have clean water. Um, and we're able to look after their welfare and motivation much better. Indeed, we're also making sure they're better trained to do their jobs more professionally and safely. They do an incredibly dangerous job. And it could be that they are in the line of fire against poachers. It could be that the poachers have used poison which is deadly to anything. Um, and the poisons they use can kill thousands of people anywhere. In most countries, they are banned, um, but not all countries. And unfortunately, some of these poisons are used. And if they are badly managed, we could have fatalities. So we may, must make sure that any scenario a ranger is in, whether it is a car crash, whether it is a, an, an elephant that is injured, whether it's an elephant or a lion that is in community lands and, and causing problems, whatever the situation is, even armed poachers, they are able through their professional training to keep safe and professionally manage that scenario. Any one of you were to come on holiday, you would want to know that that's, that service is there and they are always there to make sure that they are there for the next tourist or the next patrol, or whatever it might be. So it is our job, and that's why we have the US military, the UK military, UNODC, the Red Cross, and others training uh, our young teams to standards probably never seen before across Africa. Um, and this is a movement across Africa. It's not just us doing it. Um, we, no one else, I think, has the sort of um, US, UK military support we get, but that's simply because... Um, we don't, they, they come and do it for free, to be honest with you. They, they are, we manage the program and they come to do it for free. So we're incredibly lucky. Um, and we have a lot of work to do to, to, to develop the skill specializations throughout all areas of the park management. Finally, the, the, the last theme is the critical capabilities. 
what happens if an elephant or a giraffe or a lion is seen in a, in a snare or a trap or is seen with a disease like anthrax? What happens if a, if a, poison, a poisoning is, is suspected? What happens if there is a tourism crash or, or problem with an elephant crushing a car or something? What happens when two rangers observe a group of heavily armed poachers? How do they make sure that they can coordinate and have the capabilities, the appropriate capabilities and skill sets on the ground to be able to solve that problem? For a veterinary response unit to be able to save an animal takes experience and trained people, skilled people. Um, to be able to carry out a, a professional anti-poaching um, operation using the same scenario if two people found a heavily heavily armed group how would they make sure that they would um, professionally suppress that that threat and they would call it in two more teams would be sent out there they would not engage but with the weight of numbers they would make sure that people are arrested and making sure therefore that people aren't going through a gun a, a shootout and people getting injured and killed it's the last thing we want um, so we, we have to make sure that we have our capabilities, including marine ranger capabilities, to counter all the different types of threats we might, might encounter. Um, the pictures on the bottom, of course, in the middle, your heffalumps, they're all very happy drinking away there. On the left, this is a lot of, a lot of um, rucksacks being delivered. These are actually made by um, some Ukrainian ladies who come from um, come from Ukraine, obviously, but they live in Birmingham. And um, through COVID and through the conflict, I knew their company and I said, would you please make us 100 rucksacks? And they're, they're, they, they actually make them for the special forces around the world, but they were going bust through COVID. And I'm glad to say that through various orders of conservation, we've managed to keep them going, which, of course, they've needed with, with the Ukraine conflict. On the right-hand side, um, it's actually in Queen Elizabeth. This is we've we've reopened 16 waterholes that that are silted up, going back to the 1970s, 80s, 90s, when the poaching killed the uh, elephants, buffaloes, and hippos, um, who would otherwise be churning the silt up and carrying the, the mud out on their backs. And without the the waterholes being there, of course, the distributions of animals changed. And often that pushed animals into vulnerable areas where they were at high risk to get involved in crop raiding or some type of conflict. Um, and the net result has been that when, since we've opened these waterholes, animals have started to come back into the areas where we can better protect them and conflict is less, um, is lessened, basically. So what, what I put in the next couple of slides is essentially what I've just told you. But for those who want to have the, the presentation, I've just provided the words. I won't go through it one by one because there's nothing worse than just reading slides. But it does give you an idea of the, the volume of projects that IEF and UCF have done together to be able to get the results that we have got. It's a significant advance um, and one that is 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 able to sustain for the next 20 to 30 to 40 years. So this is the first point about infrastructure. This gives you an idea of what a ranger post was on the left-hand side and is on the right-hand side. Um, can you imagine coming back from a six-day patrol, soaking wet, hungry, um, and going into the, the mud hut on the left, where you share it with scorpions, spiders, and if it's raining, snakes? Um, pretty miserable. On the right, Kololo Ranger Post, you've got clean water, solid room, dry lights, um, you, your, your ammunitions and stores are locked up, you're safe, your welfare is cared for. And the same, the same along the bottom ones as well. These two maps were to illustrate um, the distribution of Ranger Posts. So let's first of all take you to the left-hand side um, I'm hoping you can see my cursor. Um, but if we're starting at headquarters, which is here, all of these ranger posts are basically around the edge of the park. If you see the blue dots, and this is a ferry crossing. 
And these ones here are actually on the edge of the park as well. This one is not on the edge of the park, but it's on the main road. That's on the main road. And this was the only ranger post in the whole of South Murchison Falls um, in, the, in the core area, 3,000 square kilometers. Now on the right hand side is what you see today. Um, if I put my cursor here, this is where a marine ranger post went called Kabim, another one called Samania. And in the last four or five months, a range of posts called Boligi, a marine station. One of the issues was that these are community areas and the communities would come across in their boats in their hundreds and sometimes thousands without these range of posts here, lay their snares in their tens of thousands and load up the meat and just paddle across again, but pretending to fish. Now we've put these marine stations here with small patrol boats, we are able to make sure that the, um, the pretend fishermen, the poaching groups, are less able to come across the River Nile and be able to lay their snares and even be able to collect any meat. The principle of a lot of what we've done is twofold. One is that if we can stop poaching, go above 2%, maybe even 3% of the park's animals, we will have a massive recovery. If we can keep it to 1%, the recovery is just extraordinary. If we go close to 10%, we don't recover. We start to go down the other way again. So ours is a case of we're never going to stop poaching, but we can disrupt it so much that a poacher can only kill one animal. What used to happen was they would go into the parks, into areas such as here or here. They would set up a permanent camp, and, and set thousands of snares. And then teams would come in moving the meat out to, to meet vehicles to take it to Kampala, the capital city, and other cities, and sell it. It was commercial at levels of, of, of poaching that was huge, thousands of animals. Um, so you can imagine from 16,000 elephants down to a few hundred, and that's just the elephants, Imagine all of the other antelopes and whatever warthogs that were killed. I mean, there were hundreds of thousands of them. So to not allow these camps to ever be built or ever be operational, poachers are struggling to, to actually um, kill many animals. And if they do kill a few, well, it's not hundreds, and it's certainly not thousands. So we're going to be in a massive recovery. And we keep our effort going until the animals do extremely well and tourism grows and we can employ more people from those communities. And even the poachers, like we have in the north of the park, we have 100 youth from different villages, um, and they're all from communities who are struggling with crop raiding, or indeed are involved in poaching. And after four years, the youth have done um, vocational college courses, apprenticeships, and have worked in the park, building our ranger posts, building the roads, doing the snare sweeps as scouts employed by UCF and in multiple other projects run by other people. So in other words, they are employed. And that is 100 families, um, which in a very, very vulnerable area are now supportive of the park. That's the sort of program that can make an extraordinary difference. Going back to the, um, the map on the right, you will see the yellow dots are now spread out in the core areas of the parks. And that means that we have our strong teams in the park all the time, and they're on patrol in those areas all the time. And you'll, 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 you'll see from the numbers of wildlife that have recovered, that in itself has triggered a, a huge distribution recovery and population recovery. Um, so this is again going into the second part of it. This shows you what the veterinary department looks like and then the veterinary department in action. Um, here, looking after a lion, a Rothschild's giraffe, when we were researching the, um, the rashes on the, the giraffes, which is simply a microfilaria, um, there was no need to take any action. It wasn't life-threatening at all. So having worked it out with, with the Ugandan Wildlife Authority and Tough Sioux, we were able to, Chris Witter there, we were able to um, ascertain no further action was necessary. And on the right, it, we were looking after a, a young female elephant that had a snare, very badly actually on her ankle. 
This was the third point, looking after the rangers being trained. Um, the variety of training is extraordinary. Um, and we are now with State Department and DOD in America, building a ranger training college in Murchison to make sure that we can continue to do this type of thing um, for the future, rather than taking rangers to other places, which is a huge expense, we will be able to do it on our own land um, with our own teachers, and they will still be operational in those areas. And I placed the ranger training college in a heavy poaching area to make sure that when we do ranger recruitment or any training, they suddenly see 500 rangers in the area and poaching disappears. So it's to add to the ability to control the park. The Joint Operations Command Center is on the left-hand side. This is the, the, one of the exciting projects that's happened recently. Um, bricks and mortar, yes, but it's there for the long term. At the back of that building is an operations center in which all of the signals of digital radios, phones, hotlines, satellite collars on elephants or lions, get put on into a program called Earth Ranger. Earth Ranger, if you're unaware of it, is Paul Allen, who with Bill Gates created Microsoft. One of his passions was um, to support protected areas. So he turned to, let's say, 10 to 15 protected area managers across Africa and said, what is it you actually need? What can technology help you with? And we needed an operations room. Um, something like you might see in in uh, CSI Miami or whatever it is. Um, it's a battle room where you have screens. You can see your map on your maps on the screens where your rangers are, where your animals are, if there's a fire in the park, where your cars are. You can pretty much run the park in real time. And all of that information is, is, is given to you in a visual way. Rather than reading report after report on a daily basis, not really being able to visualize what's going on in the park, you're now seeing it from systems and signals immediately. So at the back of the room there is that, and people are able to communicate between patrols to the, to, to the operations room. Out, from, from the outside of the park, whether it's a hotline, inside of the park, whether it's the phones, um, and certainly then you've got the digital radios. You've also then got the intelligence department, which is at the back of that, that, that uh, building as well where they're, if they arrest someone, they might get the telephone from them and then they'll be able to do analytics on it and see if people are in some way um, in communication or working together. And it can provide you what you call network analysis, where we may well find that one person is actually working with someone within the Ugandan Wildlife Authority to get information, to know what patrols are going out, et cetera, et cetera. We then have the warden's room, and then we have the legal room, which is the front left. And the legal room is where you've got the prosecutors and the investigators. It's all well and good spending lots of effort catching people, but you've got to go to court, and you've got to win that court case, and you've got to get a good sentence. And that means throughout the process, you've got to carry out a, a patrol in a professional manner. You've got to be recording everything that happens. You've got to be able to... Um, present the evidence, not just we did this, we did, you have to show the mapping of what you did and the pictures geolocated and dated, obviously. And you have to present the crime scene evidence, you have to present the statements, you have to present the case and use the law with the prosecute, prosecutor to be able to sentence the poachers that you catch. Um, so the legal department is increasingly important. Um, the the smart vehicle you're seeing there, again, IEF support, um, is a quick reaction force vehicle. It stays at the Joint Operations Command Center until there is a need for it to rush to respond to something. Whether that response is anti-poaching or problem animal control or whatever the situation might be in the park, there is also another vehicle, um, which is a veterinary response unit car, which goes which is separate, so it has its own requirements and its own um, dart guns and drugs on board. So we have two vehicles that are quick reaction force vehicles at the moment, but inevitably that over 5,000 square kilometers is simply not enough. Um, but it provides us with a starting point and thankfully it's really helping us. Um, 
the capability fourth point is 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 listed here the sort of things that we have been providing to make sure the operational side of what we're doing is covered whilst it's important to put in the foundations of part management the next layer is about making sure you get operational excellence you're, you're looking at how professional our teams are in the military you might say the golden hour when someone is injured can you save them it's no different it's no different to being able to save an elephant or a lion. You've got to get there quickly. You've got to get to a problem animal control situation before the damage has happened, potentially before someone has been, someone's life has been put at risk. And if you can get there beforehand, all the better. The next slide simply provides you a little bit of um, a visual about what Earth Ranger might, what, what it tries to do effectively bringing information from multiple different areas, sit reps, every single day at six o'clock in the morning, seven o'clock in the morning, every ranger post and every patrol will call into the operations center with a lot of information about how their patrol is going and what's been going on in their area. So that, that happens every day anyway. Digital radios will be tracking exactly where cars are, boats are, motorbikes are, patrols are. So we will be able to see um, what they're doing and where they're doing it. We've then got the phones, the satellite collars, the hotline, intelligence information. We've got geofences that, that are there. And of course, we can see um, fires from satellite as well, which is another integration that, that the Earth Ranger team through Vulcan have done. And it's the power of technology. And what you're seeing in the middle of the picture there is an operations room with the screen showing all of these feeds providing you with the real-time information on the ground where you can monitor and manage decision-making, budgets, operational decisions, whatever. Ultimately, it's all about supporting the action on the ground. But what we've learned very quickly is that whilst you have a lot of information, you now need to be able to manage that information for the different tiers of reporting. In any government institution, you have to report to your supervisors, your management teams. The managers have to report to the Ministry of Tourism, Trade and Antiquities. Everyone needs a tier of compliance and management uh, governance. So reports need to be generated by the Community Conservation Department, Tourism Department, the Law Enforcement Department on a weekly, monthly, quarterly, six monthly and annual basis. Now that's a very arduous, difficult, thing. You can imagine any government department in the world with the volume of information that's coming in about any type of um, interaction going on in the park is, is difficult to manage. But what we're now trying to do is to automate the, the, the structure of a report and automate the population of graphs, tables um, throughout the report to make sure that the warden in charge of law enforcement, for instance, isn't spending 80% of his or her time trying to pull together analytics that they're simply not trained for. These are soldiers, basically. Um, they are not statisticians or IT specialists. So if we can create the scenario where they, most of this is done for them and they simply top and tail and explain what's happening, they say, well, this month my objectives were, the context was that we had COVID and no vehicle or no fuel or something. Next month, this is what we're trying to achieve suddenly they save 40 or 50 percent of their time and they're able to provide that time to leadership back in the field and that's the critical point here so we're, we're in the we're in the throes of a very large management, um, information management um, operation if you like working with earth ranger and working with another company uh, called tableau who are helping with earth ranger it's a business analytics group so it takes Excel to another level. Here we have the team who are seeing the camera traps through Earth Ranger and poachers being identified on the camera traps where a GSM SIM card immediately sends it to the operations room and Christine and on the left, Gerald, will be able to immediately call their wardens and say, we have poachers caught on a camera trap. They are moving from this point to that point. We can set out an ambush um, and hopefully we can we can arrest these guys. So here we're using technology in a very basic way. 
to accomplish um, visibility and coverage in a park without having to have a human being there 24 seven. And that in itself helps us. What you're seeing on the right hand side is the operations room staff with Earth Ranger on the screen, the um, digital radios at the back, and then you can see radio batteries being charged on the left hand side at the back. And Earth Ranger can provide you with a considerable amount of um, information. Um, if I've, I've taken a snapshot, it's actually a slide from another presentation, so apologies from that. But what we did here was I was asked to provide by the warden in charge of uh, community conservation. He was being pushed by the minister, the local minister, to provide information and, and basically have been bullied. Um, and he asked us within 10 minutes, can you provide a snapshot of all human wildlife conflict that has happened in a particular period? Um, and we did it in five minutes and quickly presented it to him. And he had a report, a one page report that he was able to put in front of the, um, the minister, completely undermining the minister's um, rhetoric, where he was trying to get votes from people and um, over, over egg the amount of crop raiding and the severity of them. And we were able to provide very accurate information of actually what was happening. And the communities had also signed off on each and every one of these incidents. So it was irrefutable. Um, and the minister at that point was, was told to hop it in the nicest of English. <laughs> the bottom line is when the foundations of park management are put in and they're operationalized, wildlife survives. And this is the example. Here you're seeing wildlife numbers rocketing up. This is going back to the 2016, 17, up to actually 2019 numbers, where now we have over 140,000 cobs, which is like an antelope. We went through some horrid, torrid years, but the, 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 the trajectory of wildlife numbers, even if you're looking eight years ago, is pretty staggering. Some animals breed a little bit slower than others, and lions are in trouble. Elephants are doing well. Um, the, the Uganda cobs and the antelopes, antelopes are doing well. Um, it takes time for something like a lion to recover, especially when a lioness is killed. Um, but the aerial survey that IEF um, so kindly with others, Save the Elephants and others, help sponsor, shows pretty clearly in a short period of time, we started this project in 2012, realistically not a lot was achievable with very little money at the beginning so by the time of 2014 15 we were beginning to get some real traction and in here you can see elephant numbers in 2015 going from 1400 to 2700 the standard error is basically saying there could easily be 645 elephants there and realistically there will be um, the new way of doing the aerial survey is another part of the technology and conservation that we've been involved in. I can be, I can explore more. Of, I can answer that question a bit further um, if, if people want in the Q&A. But the, the number that's really important here is the cob number. These are the antelopes. This, this is your lion fodder. Um, 1,800 to 146,000. It was 40,000 in 2012. So we put 100,000 cobs on, and then right now, I would, I would suspect if we did another aerial survey today, we'd be pushing towards 200,000. And the distribution is much further across the park. Um, now that means more home ranges for lions, more safety for all animals, and better grazing, which will be better for um, habitat management and, and less risk from fire, for instance. We need the he he uh, mega herbivores, we need the herbivores eating through the grasslands we've got. We have far too much grass, and farm management is a very big issue. So the more wildlife we have, the better, because we, we, need to, we, we have too much habitat, if you like. Um, so what, what can I really sort of sum it up? That's the last slide. The, the bottom line, Murchison has gone through ridiculous turmoil over the years, and over the last... 10 years, thanks to the recovery of Murchison Falls program with partners such as IEF and all of those who have helped IEF to help us, 
we've managed to pull apart from close to being closed down um, to being right back into the top 10 in Africa. There is still significant poaching. I'm back in the UK now and I see it every morning because I'm on Earth Ranger every morning with, with the operations room across Queen Elizabeth and Kadepo and Murchison. And unfortunately, we are under considerable pressure. One of those pressures is we only have a fifth of the number of rangers that we require. And that is a consequence of us not, I say us, the Uganda Wildlife Authority, not actually recruiting two years before COVID happening. And then, of course, through COVID couldn't, and now are only just going through a recruitment. So six years of no recruitment, if not more. And unfortunately, during that time, many people are retiring. Some people have died. Some people have just walked away. Um, you've got people who, including the good, bad, and the ugly, but we simply don't have enough rangers. And that's why we have been engaging the community youth to be our scouts, basically undertaking the tasks that are low risk and removing snares from the, the savannas. They don't do patrols, formal patrols, because they can be jolly dangerous. Um, but the bottom line is we now have a community program that is, is ridiculously successful um, and needs to continue with new hundred youth. And at the same time, we have to keep supporting the operations of the park. We've seen this recovery to this level, and I would not be surprised in the, in, well after I've retired if we end up at 500,000 or even a million cobs. And just imagine how many lions that is. If we got back to 10,000 elephants, we'd be doubling Uganda's population. And I see absolutely no reason why that isn't possible and why that isn't on the course that we're already on. So we're, we're doing the right things. We need to keep it going. Thank you very much. Wow, that was amazing. And what an incredible overview and really lays out all the details that, that I think people don't necessarily intuitively know, but really need to understand about conservation. Um, we had some questions in the chat, so why don't we dive right in? Um, someone was asking about uh, the general um, like sentences when we're talking about um, law enforcement and prosecuting of poachers? Okay. Um, in 2019, we, the government of Uganda with the Ugandan Wildlife Authority passed the Wildlife Act, and it did two things. One was to strengthen sentencing and the, the legal um, frameworks you could use. The second thing was also to, um, for the first time ever, introduce compensation for crop raiding. Now that's an incredibly dangerous thing and it was not what we wanted. Um, and in Kenya, this has created thousands upon thousands of cases that the, the Kenya Wildlife Service can't possibly manage, let alone pay. Um, and it's a significant problem. The, going back to the questions on sentencing, it depends on what's happened. What is the crime that has been committed? Um, often it's a custom, we, we use customary law, uh, sometimes we use the Wildlife Act, but we will look at what we've got and say, what is the best legal tool to be able to use to be able to get the best sentence in the courts we're going to? And you have to be shrewd. Uh, I'm not a lawyer, um, but you have to know what, what makes the, this magistrate tick. What, what's his or her foibles? Um, what do they like to see? Did you not produce the evidence in the right way? Um, we had in, in a gorilla um, being was killed in, in Bwindi, Impenetrable National Park, I think it was two years ago now, um, three years ago maybe, and the gentleman who did it got 11 years in prison, and he was actually trying to kill a, another antelope through a snare. Um, the, the people can get life now um, if they are caught with the right evidence. Um, you also have to look at this in a different way. Some poachers are criminals. They are horrible people, and they have robbed, they have murdered, they have done many other things as well. Those people are usually the people who go into the, the ivory trade, um, who usually go into the pangolin trade and that sort of thing. And they are heavily armed, and they are people you want to put away for life. 
and and about seven eight years ago the then warden in charge of law enforcement julius who got the the Duke of Cambridge Award for um, being the best ranger in Africa for 2018. He, he and I sat down and said, who are the top 25? We've got to put them away. And he put them away. And um, they then started to threaten his family because they also live in the north of Uganda. It's not very difficult to find out where people are from. And that, that's where things also get very nasty. Criminal gangs have networks and networks attack your families. So you have to be incredibly careful about what's happening and how it's done and um, the protection that people get when this sort of thing happens. Um, you have different types of poachers as well. You have the, I talked about the fishing boats coming across and, and laying snares. Now, they have no formal education. They're renting a boat. They're, they're buying or renting snares with money they basically are gonna make off um, whatever they catch, um, but they're selling that meat and by one o'clock, they're expecting, expected to be absolutely passed out on, alcohol, on cheap local alcohol. Um, the volume of that type of poaching is huge. Um, and it tells you the problem within the communities. Unemployment, 80% of the youth under 20 years old, living on a tiny piece of terrible land where they're demotivated. They've got absolutely no aspirations. They do not have a clue about the world. And the only thing they know is going into the park, which they sometimes call the World Bank as a joke, because in there they can get rich. Um, and they go and kill a few animals, sell the meat, sell the pangolin, sell whatever they can without any skills. They then get themselves in trouble and put into prison. That doesn't help. It really doesn't help. Um, we can't have prisons full of 10,000 people who who will come out after two years and have still nothing to do. And we have to somehow get them, people in their families, to start to be engaged in some way or other in alternative livelihoods, in livelihood development, even in the park, to be able to, to help us save the park and them. They are an important part of that park. They are from there. They are the custodians who have been neglected. and. It's not entirely all our fault. It's not our, all our fault. They make their own choices as human beings. But when education doesn't give them the opportunities that you and I have had, when you don't have parents because of AIDS, or you don't have parents because of war, what do you live for? What, do you, what boundaries do you have? What, what aspirations do you have? You don't. So you have to take a step back and ask how you can change the lives of these young boys and girls for the better and make sure that the region is is better looked after and that is why we talk of regional development not just conservation conservation isn't an economic pillar anywhere in the world nor will it ever be but if you can look after clean water for a million people that's part of the pillars of economic development health um, so you, you've got industry, of course, you've got transport, of course, you've got the other pillars. Uh, this is where my other hat from being a Deloitte strategist comes in. But, but the, the, the sentencing is now, is, is at times hard. Um, sometimes you'd look at it, you'd think that's too hard. Um, on the other hand, we've had years of people being busted out of prison, buying their way out of prison, poacher groups paying off judges and we also don't want to have a shoot to kill policy where this is these are human beings with with families in hard times um that is not the solution um there are times when you're defending yourselves and we do and, and it's unfortunate sometimes what can happen but it is not the way forward to go and just have a them and us and, and you enter the park we kill you but that's not the solution either. Um, so we share 20% of our, our revenues from the park. Anyone who comes through that park gate, 20% of your dollar is going into community fund. That community fund is decided upon by the local district about what they will spend it on. Clean water, education, health services, it could be anything. Um, but there's a lot more we need to be doing. And thankfully, because tourism, well, before COVID, was going through levels, record levels that we'd not sort of reached before. 
we'd moved that revenue sharing with the communities from $50,000 to nearly $500,000 in the year. Now, imagine if we could just keep tourism moving in the right direction, spread tourism from 3% of the national park being used to 60% of the national park being used. Imagine if we got lodges coming in. A lodge would usually cost five to $10 million over, let's say, 10 years with operational capex in there as well. Imagine the skills and the trade and the maintenance and the supply chains that would go to the communities that we could engage all these people in. We wouldn't be talking about $50,000 or $500,000 being shared with the communities. We would be talking about an economic impact of far greater significance. And that is where we start winning with the communities and where the communities start to say, uh, I got to call the operations room. I've just seen poachers entering the park. And it comes from them. And then we win. Um, they become our confidence. Absolutely. And that, that so perfectly dovetails into the, our next question. Um, people were asking about the recidivism rate for poachers after they complete their sentences, but I think you kind of covered that. And so talking about the community partnership and how life in those communities is different from what we might know in the West and how we sort of foster that, that, cooperation so that they become the caretakers, the custodians of the wildlife? It's, it's not easy. This morning I found myself agitated because I had to get into a car to go to a shop in the town to go and buy my shopping. Um, for them, on a quarter of an acre of land, they have to plant everything that they eat. They have nothing else. They have a mud hut um, in which they live and their extended family lives. And in that, in that little quarter of an acre of land, what they planted there is everything they've got. Um, and overnight, an elephant or the baboons or something can come in and remove their ability to feed their family, their legal ability. In, in the US or the UK or wherever, you would have a legal course of action to take um, against whoever was destroying your legal rights. They have none. Um, and they've put up with this for years. So you can see why they'd be angry. It doesn't take away the fact that many are poaching and you can't justify an illegal action for that. Um, but it is a simple fact that we have the role and responsibility to look after these people who very legally are doing exactly what you and I do at home, feeding their family. And we, we must protect them to be able to do that. And I had to think of myself again this morning going to that shop in town that took me 20 minutes and I just put my card on a piece of plastic and it took my money away and I came home and it was that easy. We're not planting anything to feed our families these days. Um, we're really divorced from reality. But when, when you've got a goat and you sell that goat like it's just happened, to be able to afford the transport to get to the local town to possibly become a ranger, to go through ranger recruitment, and you find 13,000 people have turned up in your town only, and it's in 20 other places, and there's only 800 places, and you sold your only goat to do that. Um, and then you walk home 70 kilometers. Their life is different. So we have to respect it and we have to stand up for them. And, and if we don't regard them as our closest partners, we are going to lose, irrespective of whatever we spend. And it's just not right. Yeah, and you're right. We, we have to respect that their lives are completely different and that we can't sort of see them through the lens that we see our lives. Um, but talking more about the community, you guys work very closely with Pacer Community College. Uh, can you talk about the sort of partnership you have there and how you're making a difference for communities that way? Sure. Um, Pacer Community College is a, a, a little vocational college north of Murchison Falls um, National Park. And it provided four courses. I think it was seamstressing, carpentry, metal work, and brick laying. And it's the government process and vocational college um, courses are incredibly important worldwide in every society. 
Um, you don't need 50,000 or 50 million accountants, but you certainly need carpenters and plumbers and electricians and all the really good skills. And many of them become hugely successful too. Um, but this, this vocational college was run down and was producing about 2,000 carpenters for the region. We don't need 2,000 carpenters. Now, we can't change the government um, structures and, and, and the way that they're teaching people at the moment. So in the holidays, we created alternative courses and we targeted community youth in and around the park to be able to go to the vocational college and carry out different courses. Some of those are about putting up gutters and water tanks to be able to harvest rainwater. Some of those are about um, making tetsi fly traps. Tetsi fly is a rather nasty fly that bites you and hurts and creates, used to create sleeping sickness. Um, and those can be bought by the tourism lodges and even the park. But that's ladies groups who then get employed to do it. So another course was fencing. Um, another course was, was industrial painting. Um, and um, we're doing one right now, which is all about construction, a month long um, course about different types of construction, the stages you go through. And a lot of what we're doing is bringing in private sector companies like Plascon Paints um, or Hema Cement, and they deliver professional courses within the month. And the kids get certificates to be able, which they create a CV or through. Um, to be able to go to a construction company and say, look, look, look I've done something and it's recognized. Um, could I become a, you know, a laborer and, and maybe a, a metal worker or whatever? But we've also created a, a, a tree nursery there with indigenous trees, for fruiting trees and for um, hardwood trees. And we're, we're planting about 50 to 100,000 every season. So that's 100,000 to 200,000 a year. Um, in and around the area. Now, with, with the trees being cut down for charcoal and for construction, the soil is getting heavily degraded um, and soil fertility goes down, which means greater problems for the communities. That's without what we had through COVID, where we had the River Nile flooding as well. Um, there's a lovely group called Trees That Feed in Chicago, who are now providing us with $3 per tree. Um, they can't do it all the time, but um, once they've raised money, we're able to put within the communities trees. They've got an app where we register them, and they literally monitor their tree growing. And you can see around the world where they're doing this. And I think it's the greatest green movement step for a long time. We always hear about carbon sequestration, carbon trading. We hear about the airlines and are you being carbon neutral? Who knows what that really means? But if that can be converted into a tree on the ground, you can see the tree on the ground. And you know that you've planted 50 million trees or whatever you planted. So here, here we have a nursery that is totally run by local community guys in the vocational college, where there are 2,000 trees planted already in the vocational college. It's gone from a hot, hot, belting, sweaty college to a college full of trees and fruit. And it's a staggering thing. And everyone who drives past goes, hang on a second. I didn't think trees could grow here. And now they do. And they're coming in to do community classes and they're growing their own trees, which is helping nutrition of thousands of people, tens of thousands of people. So every course we do at the college also has to have a legacy. It's all well and good being able to say, yeah, here's how you paint. But whilst you're painting um, and learning to paint, your practical is paint the ladies' dormitories. And by the way, there weren't any ladies' dormitories. There weren't any ladies at the vocational college. So the brick making course created the bricks. The HEMA cement guys created the cement. We built the ladies' dormitories, built the ladies' ablution block toilets. The fencing guys fenced the entire school, including an area just for ladies. And um, us horrible boys are kept out. And um, the ladies are now coming to the college, um, which is wonderful. And they are being involved in cookery classes, in seamstressing classes. New classes are coming up. And that in itself is a huge success but every course has to leave something behind it. It can't just, that's how you fence goodbye. Well done, you've learned how to fence, now do 200 meters of fencing. Um, and that, that's the beauty of it, because the college is getting rebuilt because of that. The classrooms, everything. That's wonderful. And, you're, and you are creating that 
community conservation ethic because everyone's feeling invested in the work. Um, you mentioned uh, charcoal burning and harvesting um, wood for charcoal. Can you talk about that and sort of the negative impacts of charcoal stoves and what's being done about that? Well, it, it comes down to that that same question we had before. I mean, the, the, the communities don't necessarily have an alternative. Um, they can use wood, very inefficient, and they're burning masses of it, and it's the most expensive cost for the vocational college and the hospital and the schools. Um, and for a local person, maybe they've cut down their trees already, so what do they do next? They go into the park and try and get trees, which they're not allowed to do, um, and then they get in trouble with us again. Um, charcoal is a big industry and it is not local consumption. The, here, you, the, the big trigger over the last years was Kenya, actually, our, our next door neighbor, um, banned charcoal production. But what that did was to throw the entire demand into Uganda. And business people, quite, you know, you'd, you'd imagine they would, went around cutting everything down, creating charcoal, and driving it to Kenya. Now, well done, Kenya, good decision. Unfortunately for Uganda, we haven't got strong enough governance. And maybe the people who are in governance are involved in it as well. Who knows? I won't, won't say more. But here, here you have two destructive um, ways of, of construction and for cooking. So it does then say, okay, well, what do we do about it? Yeah, you can plant trees. You've got to plant trees. That, that's a, that's a, a prerequisite for the future. But and a variety of indigenous trees, um, fruiting and hardwood, for construction and for for um, fruiting and medicinal as well, I might add. But um, we've got to look at how something like the vocational college can reduce its costs and use that as an example to everybody else. And we can go to the hospital and say, look, we can reduce your fuel costs by seven eighths. And how can you do that? Well, let's put these stoves in. Here are the pots. Off you go. Great. Would you like to put in 10,000 trees as well, by the way? Um, and, and, you know, it's not terribly, it's not rocket science, but the, the, the key comes in when you get to the local person, when they're cooking at home. How do you get them to be able to cook efficiently and effectively without destroying their quarter of an acre or the environment they're living in and degrading their soil um, and soil fertility? And, and that's... Uh, that's a tricky one. And yes, fuel efficient stoves, briquettes can be made out of waste and even, even poor scrub, which has been cleared from like invasive species within national parks or outside. Um, that sort of effort is, is very important, um, but it takes an awful lot of effort. Um, so you've got a lot of education going on. So the PACE program is something we run across that region. And it's the Pan-African Conservation Education Program where lots of different topics. Um, uh, we work with the communities, ladies groups, the school kids, so that it becomes indoctrinated in their psyche of, of how to go forwards in life and, and, and what they do around the, the area and landscape they work in. But yeah, I mean, the, the, the simple fact is they don't have electric cookers. They don't have gas cookers. They are not going to get solar cookers in the near future. Um, so they will be using some sort of carbon. And whether that's biogas, which is terribly expensive, especially for an individual, um, unlikely. So you are still going back to wood and charcoal, which means you've got to find a sustainable way of using it, reduce the waste, but make sure it's efficient and effective. Yeah, well, that there are definitely solutions and we're, we're glad that you know, the common sense is ringing through and we're making progress. Um, we're a little bit over time, so we probably should wrap up. So why don't we talk, maybe wrap up by saying how we in the Western world can keep helping the people and helping the wildlife in the region. What are the greatest needs? What can we do to help? Um, this sort of thing is something that's been um, needed for decades. Uh, people in the world need to be able to find access to field projects, 
simply. They can engage on a personal level. They can engage and be inspired and, and look after the next generation easily. For too long, conservation has been kept as an exclusive club. Sometimes that's from academia. Sometimes that's because of private lands or whatever it is. And it's, this is breaking that. We have got to make it easy for people to, to um, fulfill their love for being involved in this type of thing. So definitely more of this. Um, I'm very happy to, to do as much as you like about specific things if necessary, or even get other people on, on board as well, and it becomes much more. Yes, a lot of it's about funding. Yes, a lot of it's about helping communications get through. Um, sometimes it's encouragement. Um, you know, we've gone through three years of hell um, of trying to keep the park alive. We were the only organization in Queen Elizabeth Murchison and Kadepo paying for the range of food, um, paying to keep vehicles moving, paying for fuel. Um, I was horrified that the conservation world is so disingenuous. Um, this was the time when people, everyone in the world was struggling. That, that's clear. But the community, the park people, if we wanted tourism to, to be able to come back and be able to kickstart again and to be able to see the wildlife again, we needed a little bit of fuel. We needed to be able to change the bald tires on a car. I needed to be able to treat someone with malaria, which costs five bucks or less. It, so sometimes it's just a case of knowing what's going on. Now, during that period, um, it would have been wonderful to do this. I'm not saying it's your fault, you shouldn't have. <laughs> but but it is this, this sort of engagement is unbelievably important to be able to grow the movement and ease of access for people to be involved. And I, I see in the names here, various people I've dealt with in the past. Um, April, I know you're there. Um, you know, April has messaged me a couple of times from the Elephant Managers Association and said, how can we help? And, you know, sometimes that has been golden. Um, and uh, everyone is a partner as far as I'm concerned. I happen to be there. Come and see us. Come and enjoy Uganda. Keep involved. Um, what else can I say, really? <laughs> yeah, that's perfect. And you know what? That's exactly why we have these conservation chats, because we we saw, especially in the past two and three years, that how that's exactly the time when we needed to step up more. The whole world is pulling back. The whole world was, you know, locking down. And that's exactly when conservation was needed the most. So we... And Sarah, just on that point, we, 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 UCF nearly went into bankruptcy. And if it wasn't for IEF, through the Berry Family Trust, we would not have got through 2021. Um, and it's because of IEF and because of the followers and everyone involved that we were able to get through the year and keep going. So just so everyone realizes that, and obviously you know I'm hugely thankful anyway, but uh, just so everyone realizes that. Wow. That, and that's why we do what we do, because this work is that important and we need to step up, especially when the need is so dire and when the work is so good. I think the reactions in the chat, everyone can see why your work is valuable, why UCF is, works is valuable and the impact that is being made. So we are so honored to work with you and give you this platform and do everything we can to expand the good work that is being done. Because you're right, when you say the potential is there to have an incredible recovery, we are already seeing the, the proof of that. So we need to just keep going. True. Well, thank you so much. Let's have everyone unmute and give you a round of applause because this was incredible. Uh, people can turn on your cameras if you want and let's, let's thank Mike for his incredible talk. <laughs> Oh, oh, Yay. Wonderful. Thank you all. Thank you guys so much. Um, we will have another conservation chat in August and hopefully we will we'll, we will definitely have Mike back because there is always something great happening in Uganda that we need to report back and there's always need in Uganda as as we can see.
and it's worthwhile. So thanks everyone. I'm sorry we went over time, but I think it was worth it. Uh, and Julie will be in touch with you all with a recording of today in case you wanna share it with your friends or watch back. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, guys.